Disc 19, Feet of Clay By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 16x18 Carry got out. The king started to run after them, but hit an immediate problem. It had put its leg on back to front. It began to limp in a circle but, somehow, the circle got nearer to them. We can't just leave Dorflo lying there slash said Carrot. He pulled a long metal rod out of a stirring tank and eased himself back down to the grease-crusted floor. The king rocked towards him. Carrot hopped backwards, steadied himself on a rail, and swung. The golem lifted its hand, caught the rod out of the air and tossed it aside. It raised both fists and tried to step forward. It couldn't move. It looked down. THSSS, said what remained of door flow, gripping its ankle. The king bent, swung one hand with the palm edgewise, and calmly sheared the top off door flow's head. It removed the chem and crumpled it up. The glow died in door flow's eyes. Anguacanonied into carrot so hard he almost fell over. She wrapped both arms around him and pulled him after her. It just killed Dorflo, just like that, said Carrot. It's a shame, yes, said Angua. Or it would be if Dorflo had been alive. Carrot, they're like... Machinery. Look, we can make it to the door Carrot shook himself free. It's murder, he said. We're watchmen. We can't just... Watch. It killed him. It's an it and so's he, Commander Vim said someone has to speak for the people with no voices. He really believes it, Angua thought. Vim's puts words in his head. Keep it occupied, he shouted, and darted away. How? Organize a sing-song. I've got a plan. Oh, good. Vim's looked up at the entrance of the candle factory. He could dimly see two cressets burning on either side of a shield. Look at that, will you, he said. Paint not dry and he flaunts the thing for all the world to see. What's dat, sir, said Detritus. His damn coat of arms. Detritus looked up. Why's it got a lighted fish on it, he said. In heraldry that's a poisson, said Vims bitterly. And it's supposed to be a lamp. A lamp made out of a poisson, said Detritus. Well, dear Safnk. At least it's got the motto in proper language, said Sergeant Colin. Instead of all the old-fashioned stuff no one understands. Art brought forth the candle. That, Sergeant Detritus, is a pun, or play on words. Cause his name is Arthur. C. Vim stood between the two sergeants and felt a hole open up in his head. Damn, asterisk he said. Damn, damn, damn. He showed it to me. Dumb plotter Vim's. He won't notice. Oh, yes. And he was right. S not that good, said Colin. I mean... You've got to know that Mr. Carey's first name is Arthur. Shut up, Fred, snapped Vims. Shutting up right now, sir. The arrogance of the... Who's that? A figure darted out of the building, glanced around hurriedly, and scurried along the street. That's Carey, said Vims. He didn't even shout after him, but went from a standing start to a full run. The fleeing figure dodged between the occasional straying sheep or pig and didn't have a bad turn of speed, but Vim's was powered by sheer anger and was only yards away when Carrie ducked into an alleyway. Vim skidded to a halt and grabbed at the wall. He'd seen the shape of a crossbow and one of the things you learned in the watch. That is, one of the things which hopefully you'd have a chance to learn was that it was a very stupid thing indeed to follow someone with a crossbow into a dark alley where you'd be outlined against any light there was. I know it's you, Carrie, he shouted. I've got a crossbow. You can only fire it once. 
I want to turn King's evidence. Guess again. Kerry lowered his voice. They just said I could get the damn golem to do it. I didn't think anyone was going to get hurt. Right, right, said Vims. You made poisoned candles because they gave a better light, I expect. You know what I mean. They told me it would all be all right and which they would they be. They said no one would ever find out. Really? Look, look, they said they could. The voice paused, and took on that wheedling tone the blunt-witted use when they're trying to sound sharp. If I tell you everything, you'll let me go, right? The two sergeants had caught up. Vims pulled Detritus towards him, although in fact he ended up pulling himself towards Detritus. Go round the corner and see he doesn't come out of the alley the other way, he whispered. The troll nodded. What's it you want to tell me, Mr. Carey, said Vims to the darkness in the alley. Have we got a bargain? What? A bargain? No. We damn well haven't got a bargain, Mr. Carey. I'm not a tradesman. But I'll tell you something, Mr. Carey. They betrayed you. There was silence from the darkness, and then a sound like a sigh. Behind Vims, Sergeant Colin stamped his feet on the cobbles to keep warm. You can't stay in there all night, Mr. Carey, said Vims. There was another sound. A leathery sound. Vims glanced up into the coils of fog. Something's not right, he said. Come on. He ran into the alley. Sergeant Colin followed, on the basis that it was fine to run into an alley containing an armed man provided you were behind someone else. A shape loomed at them. Detritus. Yes, sir. Where did he go? There are no doors in the alley. Then his eyes grew more accustomed to the gloom. He saw a huddled outline at the foot of a wall, and his foot nudged a crossbow. Mr. Carey. He knelt down and lit a match. Oh, nasty, said Sergeant Colin. Something's broken his neck. Dead, is he, said Detritus. You want I should draw a chalk outline round him? I don't think we need bother, Sergeant. It no bother, I've got der chalk right here. Vims looked up. Fog filled the alley, but there were no ladders, no handy low roofs. Let's get out of here, he said. Angua faced the king. She resisted a terrible urge to change. Even a werewolf's jaws probably wouldn't have any effect on the thing. It didn't have a jugular. She daren't look away. The king moved uncertainly, with little jerks and twitches that in a human would suggest madness. Its arms moved fast but erratically, as if signals that were being sent were not arriving properly. And Dorflo's attack had left it damaged. Every time it moved, red light shone from dozens of new cracks. You're cracking up, she shouted. The oven wasn't right for pottery. The king lunged at her. She dodged and heard its hand slice through a rack of candles. You're cranky. You're baked like a loaf. You're half-baked. She drew her sword. She didn't usually have much use for it. She found a smile would invariably do the trick, a hand sliced the top off the blade. She stared at the sheared metal in horror and then somersaulted back as another blow hummed past her face. Her foot rolled on a candle and she fell heavily, but with enough presence of mind to roll before a foot stamped down. Where ve you gone? she yelled. Can you get it to move a little closer to the doors, please? said a voice from the darkness on high. Carrot crawled out along the rickety structure that supported the production line. Carrot. Almost there. The king grabbed at her leg. She lashed out with her foot and caught it on the knee. To her amazement she made it crack. But the fire below was still there. The pieces of pottery seemed to float on it. 
No matter what anyone did the golem could keep going, even if it were just a cloud of dust held together. Ah! Right, said Carrot, and dropped off the gantry. He landed on the king's back, flung one arm around its neck, and began to pound on its head with the hilt of his sword. It staggered and tried to reach up to pull him off. Got to get the words out. Carrot shouted, as the arms flailed at him. It's the only way. The king staggered forward and hit a stack of boxes, which burst and rained candles over the floor. Carrot grabbed its ears and tried to twist. Angua heard him saying. You. Have. The right. To. A lawyer. Carrot. Don't bother with its damn rights. You. Have. The right to just give it the last ones. There was a commotion in the gaping doorway and Vims ran in, sword drawn. Oh, gods. Sergeant Detritus. Detritus appeared behind him. Saw. Crossbow bolt through the head, if you please. TF you say so, sir. It's head, Sergeant. Mine is fine. Carrot. Get down off the thing. Can't get its head off, sir. We'll try six feet of cold steel in the ear just as soon as you let the damn thing go. Carrot steadied himself on the king's shoulders, tried to judge his moment as the thing staggered around, and leapt. He landed awkwardly on a sliding heap of candles. His leg buckled under him and he tumbled over until he was stopped by the inert shell that had been door flow. Hey, look this way, mister, said Detritus. The king turned. Vims didn't catch everything that happened next, because it all happened so quickly. He was merely aware of the rush of air and the glowing of the rebounding bolt mingling with the wooden juddering noise as it buried itself in the doorframe behind him. And the golem was crouching down by Carrot, who was trying to squirm out of the way. It raised a fist and brought it down. Vims didn't even see Dorflo's arm move but there it was there, suddenly gripping the king's wrist. Tiny stars of light went nova in Dorflo's eyes. T-S-S-S-S-S-S. As the king jerked back in surprise, Dorflo held on and levered himself up on what remained of his legs. As he came up so did his fist. Time slowed. Nothing moved in the whole universe but Dorflo's fist. It swung like a planet, without any apparent speed but with a drifting unstoppability. And then the king's expression changed. Just before the fist landed, it smiled. The golem's head exploded, Vims recalled it in slow motion, one long second of floating pottery. And words. Scraps of paper flew out, dozens scores of them, tumbling gently to the floor. Slowly, peacefully, the king hit the floor. The red light died, the cracks opened, and then there were just pieces. Dorflo collapsed on top of them. Angua and Vims reached Carrot together. He came alive, said Carrot, struggling up. That thing was going to kill me and Dorflo came alive. But that thing had smashed the words out of his head. A golem has to have the words. They gave their own golem too many, I can see that, said Vims. He picked up some of the coils of paper. Create peace and justice for all. Rule use wisely. Teach US freedom. Lead US to. Poor devil, he thought. Let's get you home. That hand needs treating said Angua. Listen, will you, said Carrot. He's alive. Vims knelt down by door flow. The broken clay skull looked as empty as yesterday's breakfast egg. But there was still a pinpoint of light in each eye socket. Us, hissed door flow, so faintly that Vims wasn't sure he'd heard it. A finger scratched on the floor. Is it trying to write something, said Angua. Vims pulled out his notebook, eased it under Dorflo's hand, 
and gently pushed a pencil into the golem's fingers. They watched the hand as it wrote. A little jerkily but still with the mechanical precision of a golem. Eight words. Then it stopped. The pencil rolled away. The lights in Dorflo's eyes dwindled and went out, good grief, breathed Angua. They don't need words in their heads. We can rebuild him, said Carrot hoarsely. We have the pottery. Vim stared at the words, and then at what remained of Dorflo. Mr. Vims, said Carrot. Do it, said Vims. Carrot blinked. Right now, Vims said. He looked back at the scrawl in his book. W span lang equals enus style equals font size 10.0 pt, mso bitty font size 11.5 pt o slash span r slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 14.0 pt. MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt d slash span si slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 10.0 pt MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt n slash span the age slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 14.0 pt MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt e slash span a slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 10.0 pt MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt r slash span tca slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 10.0 pt MSO Bita font size 11.5 pt n slash span n slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 14.0 pt mso bitty font size 11.5 pt o slash span tbt slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 14.0 pt MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt a slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 10.0 pt MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt k slash span span lang equals enus style equals font size 14.0 pt MSO Biddy font size 11.5 pt e slash span n slash span and when you rebuild him he said when you rebuild him Give him a voice. Understand? And get someone to look at your hand. A voice, sir. Do it. Yes, sir. Right. Vims pulled himself together. Constable Angua and I will have a look around here. Off you go. He watched Carrot and the troll carry the remains out. Okay, he said. We're looking for arsenic. Maybe there'll be some workshop somewhere. I shouldn't think they'd want to mix the poisoned candles up with the others. Cheerio know what where is Corporal Little Bottom. ER. I don't think I can hold on much longer. They looked up. Shari was hanging on the line of candles. How did you get up there? said Vims. I sort of found myself going past. Sir. Can't you just let go? You're not that high oh. A big trough of molten tallow was a few feet under her. Occasionally the surface went gloop. ER. How hot would that be? Vim's hissed to Angua. Ever bitten hot jam, she said. Vim's raised his voice. Can't you swing yourself along, Corporal? All the wood's greasy. Sir. Corporal Little Bottom, I order you not to fall off. Very good, sir. Vims pulled off his jacket. Hang on to this. I'll see if I can climb up. He muttered. It won't work, said Angua. The thing's shaky enough as it is. I can feel my hands slipping, sir. Good grief, why didn't you call out earlier? Everyone seemed to be busy, sir. Turn around, sir, said Angua, undoing the buckles of her breastplate. Right now, please. And shut your eyes. 
Why? What? Right now, w sir. Oh. Dot yes. Vim's heard Angwa back away from the candle machine, her footsteps punctuated by the clang of falling armor. Then she started running and the footsteps changed while she was running and then. He opened his eyes. The wolf sailed upwards in slow motion, caught the dwarf's shoulder in its jaws as Sherry's grip gave way, and then arced its body so that wolf and dwarf hit the floor on the far side of the vat. Angwa rolled, whimpering. Sheree scrambled to her feet. It's a werewolf. Angwa rolled back and forth pawing at her mouth. What's happened to it, said Cherie, her panic receding a little. It looks... hurt. Where's Angwa? Oh. Vims glanced at the dwarf's torn leather shirt. You wear chain mail under your clothes, he said. Oh. It's my silver vest. But she knew about it. I told her. Vims grabbed Angwa's collar. She moved to bite him, and then caught his eye and turned her head away. She only bit the silver, said Cherie, distractedly. Angwa pulled herself onto her feet, glared at them, and slunk off behind some crates. They heard her whimpering which, by degrees, became a voice. Blasted blasted dwarfs and their blasted vests. You all right? Constable, said Vims. Damn silver underwear. Can you throw me my clothes, please? Vims bundled up Angwa's uniform and, eyes closed for decency's sake, handed it around the crates. No one told me she was a war, Cherie moaned. Look at it like this, Corporal, said Vims, as patiently as he could. If she hadn't been a werewolf you would by now be the world's largest novelty candle, all right. Angwa walked from behind the crates, rubbing her mouth. The skin around it looked too pink. It burned you, said Cherie. It'll heal, said Angwa. You never said you were a werewolf. How would you've liked me to have put it? Right, said Vims, if that's all sorted out, ladies. I want this place searched. Understand. I've got some ointment, said Cherie meekly. Thank you. They found a bag in a cellar. There were several boxes of candles. And a lot of dead rats. Igneous the troll opened the door of his pottery a fraction. He'd intended the fraction to be no more than about one sixteenth but someone immediately pushed hard and turned it into rather more than one and three quarters. Here, what's dis? he said, as detritus and carrot came in with the shell of door flow between them. You can't use break in here we ain't just breakin' in, said detritus. Dis is an outrage, said Igneous. You got no right common in here. You got no reason detritus let go of the golem and spun around. His hand shot out and caught Igneous around the throat. You see those statues of monolith over deer. You see them, he growled, twisting the other troll's head to face a row of troll religious statues on the other side of the warehouse. You want I should smash one open, see what they refill wit, maybe find a reason. Igneous slitted eyes darted this way and that. He might have been hard of thinking but he could feel a killing mood when it was in the air. No call for debt, I always help to watch, he muttered. What dis all about? Carrot laid out the golem on a table. Start, then, he said. Rebuild him. Use as much of the old clay as you can, understand. How can it work when its lights re-out, said Detritus, still puzzled by this mission of mercy. He said the clay remembers. The sergeant shrugged. And give him a tongue, said Carrot. Igneous looked shocked. I won't do dat, he said. Everybody know it blasphemy if golems speak. Oh, yeah, said Detritus. He strode across the warehouse to the group of statues and glared at them. 
Then he said, Whoops, here's me accidentally trippin' up, oh oh oh, dis is me grabbin' a statue for support, oh, der arm have come right off, where can I put my face? And what is dis white powder what I sees here with my eyes accidentally spillin' on der floor? He licked a finger and gingerly tasted the stuff. Slab, he growled, walking back to the trembling Igneous. You tellin' me about blasphemy, you sediment or why copper lith? You doin' what Captain Carrot say right now or you goin' out of here in a sack? Dis is police brutality. Igneous muttered. No, dis is just police shoutin', yelled Detritus. You want to try for brutality it okay with me. Igneous tried to appeal to Carrot. It not right, he got a badge, he puttin me in fear, he can't do dis, he said. Carrot nodded. There was a glint in his eye that Igneous should have noticed. That's correct, he said. Sergeant Detritus. Sir. It's been a long day for all of us. You can go off duty. Yes sir, said Detritus, with considerable enthusiasm. He removed his badge and laid it down carefully. Then he started to struggle out of his armor. Look at it like this, said Carrot. It's not that we're making life, we're simply giving life a place to live. Igneous finally gave up. Okay, okay, he muttered. I do in it. I do in it. He looked at the various lumps and shards that were all that remained of door flow, and rubbed the lichen on his chin. You got most of the bits, he said, professionalism edging resentment aside for a moment. I could glue him together with kill cement. Dat d do the trick if we bakes him overnight. Lussie. I reckon I got some over dear. Detritus blinked at his finger which was still white with the dust, and sidled over to Carrot. Did I just lick dis, he said. E.R., yes, said Carrot. Tank goodness for dat, said Detritus, blinking furiously, D hate to believe dis room was really full of giant hairy spied. Weeble weeble sclub. He hit the floor, but happily. Even if I do it you can't make it come alive again, muttered Igneous, returning to his bench. You won't find a priest who's goin' to write the words for in der head, not again. He'll make up his own words, said Carrot. And who's going to watch the oven, said Igneous. It's gonna take till breakfast at least. Slash I wasn't planning on doing anything for the rest of tonight, said Carrot, taking off his helmet. Vimsa woke around four o'clock. He'd gone to sleep at his desk. He hadn't meant to, but his body had just shut down. It wasn't the first time he'd opened bleary eyes there. But at least he wasn't lying in anything sticky. He focused on the report he'd half written. His notebook was beside it, page after page of laborious scrawl to remind him that he was trying to understand a complex world by means of his simple mind. He yawned, and looked out at the shank of the night. He didn't have any evidence. No real evidence at all. He'd had an interview with an almost incoherent Corporal Nobs, who hadn't really seen anything. He had nothing that wouldn't burn away like the fog in the morning. All he'd got were a few suspicions and a lot of coincidences, leaning against one another like a house of cards with no card on the bottom. He peered at his notebook. Someone seemed to have been working hard. Oh, yes. It had been him. The events of last night jangled in his head. Why'd he written all this stuff about a coat of arms? Oh, yes. Yes. Ten minutes later he was pushing open the door of the pottery. Warmth spilled out into the clammy air. He found Carrot and Detritus asleep on the floor on either side of the kill. Damn. He needed someone he could trust, but he hadn't the heart to wake them. He'd pushed everyone very hard the last few days. Something tapped on the door of the kill. 
Then the handle started to turn by itself. The door opened as far as it could go and something half slid and half fell onto the floor. Vim still wasn't properly awake. Exhaustion and the importunate ghosts of adrenaline sizzled around the edges of his consciousness, but he saw the burning man unfold himself and stand upright. His red-hot body gave little pings as it began to cool. Where it stood, the floor charred and smoked. The golem raised his head and looked around. You, said Vims, pointing an unsteady finger. Come with me. Yes, said Dorflo. Dragon King of Arms stepped into his library. The dirt of the small high windows and the remnants of the fog made sure there was never more than grayness here, but a hundred candles yielded their soft light. He sat down at his desk, pulled a volume towards him, and began to write. After a while he stopped and stared ahead of him. There was no sound but the occasional spluttering of a candle. Aha! I can smell you, Commander Vims, he said. Did the heralds let you in? I found my own way, thank you, said Vims, stepping out of the shadows. The vampire sniffed again. You came alone. Who should I have brought with me? And to what do I owe the pleasure, Sir Samuel? The pleasure is all mine. I'm going to arrest you, said Vims. Oh, dear. Aha. For what, may I ask? Can I invite you to notice the arrow in this crossbow, said Vims. No metal on the point, you'll see. It's wood all the way. How very considerate. Aha. Dragon King of Arms twinkled at him. You still haven't told me what I'm accused of, however. To start with, complicity in the murders of MRS Flora Easy and the child William Easy. I am afraid those names mean nothing to me. Vimsa's finger twitched on the bow's trigger. No, he said, breathing deeply. They probably don't. We are making other inquiries and there may be a number of additional matters. The fact that you were poisoning the patrician I consider a mitigating circumstance. You really intend to prefer charges. Teed prefer violence, said Vims loudly. Charges is what I'm going to have to settle for. The vampire leaned back. I hear you've been working very hard, Commander, he said. So I will not we've got the testimony of Mr. Carey, lied Vims. The late Mr. Carey. Dragon's expression changed by not one tiny tremor of muscle. I really do not know, aha, what you are talking about, Sir Samuel. Only someone who could fly could have got into my office. T.M. afraid you've lost me, sir. Mr. Carey was killed tonight, Vims went on by someone who could get out of an alley guarded at both ends. And I know a vampire was in his factory. TM still gamely trying to understand you, Commander, said Dragon King of Arms. I know nothing about the death of Mr. Carey and in any case there are a great many vampires in the city. I'm afraid your aversion is well known. I don't like to see people treated like cattle, said Vims. He stared briefly at the volumes piled in the room. And of course that's what you've always done, isn't it? These are the stock books of Ankh Morpork. The crossbow swung back towards the vampire, who hadn't moved. Power over little people. That's what vampires want. The blood is just a way of keeping score. I wonder how much influence you've had over the years. A little. You are correct there, at least. A person of breeding, said Vims. Good grief. Well, I think people wanted veterinary out of the way. But not dead, yet. Too many things de happened too fast if he were dead. Is Nobby really an earl? The evidence suggests so. But it's your evidence, right? You see. I don't think he's got noble blood in him. Nobby's as common as muck. 
it's one of his better points. I don't set any score by the ring. The amount of stuff his family's nicked, you could probably prove he's the Duke of Pseudopolis, the Seraph of Clatch and the Dowager Duchess of Quirm. He pinched my cigar case last year and I'm damn certain he's not me. No, I don't think Nobby is a knob. But I think he was convenient. It seemed to Vims that Dragon was getting bigger, but perhaps it was only a trick of the candle light. The light flickered as the candles hissed and popped. You made good use of me, Ed. Vims carried on. TD been ducking out of appointments with you for weeks. I expect you were getting quite impatient. You were so surprised when I told you about Nobby, Ed. Otherwise UDVE had to send for him or something very suspicious. But Commander Vims discovered him. That looks good. Practically makes it official. And then I started thinking. Who wants a king? Well, nearly everyone. It's built in. Kings make it better. Funny thing, isn't it? Even those people who owe everything to him don't like veterinary. Ten years ago most of the guild leaders were just a bunch of thugs and now. Well, they're still a bunch of thugs, to tell the truth, but veterinary's given them the time and energy to decide they never needed him. And then young Carrot turns up with charisma writ all over him, and he's got a sword and a birthmark and everyone gets a funny feeling and dozens of buggers start going through the records and say, hey, looks like the king's come back. And then they watch him for a while and say, shit, he really is decent and honest and fair and just, just like in all the stories. Whoops. If this lad gets on the throne we could be in serious trouble. He might turn out to be one of them inconvenient kings from long ago who wanders around talking to the common people you are in favor of the common people, said Dragon mildly. The common people, said Vims. They're nothing special. They're no different from the rich and powerful except they've got no money or power. But the law should be there to balance things up a bit. So I suppose I've got to be on their side. A man married to the richest woman in the city. Vim shrugged. The watchman's helmet isn't like a crown. Even when you take it off you're still wearing it. That's an interesting statement of position, Sir Samuel, and I would be the first to admire the way you've come to terms with your family history, but don't move. Vims shifted his grip on the crossbow. Anyway. Carrot wouldn't do, but the news was getting around, and someone said, Right, let's have a king we can control. All the rumors say the king is a humble watchman so let's find one. And they had a look and found that when it comes to humble you can't beat knobby knobs. But. I think people weren't too sure. Killing veterinary wasn't an option. As I said, too many things would happen too fast. But to just gently remove him, so that he's there and not there at the same time, while everyone tried out the idea. That was a good wheeze. That's when someone got Mr. Carey to make poisoned candles. He'd got a golem. Golems can't talk. No one would know. But it turned out to be a bit... erratic. You seem to wish to involve me, said Dragon King of Arms. I know nothing about this man other than that he's a customer. Vim strode across the room and pulled a piece of parchment from a board. You did him a coat of arms he shouted. You even showed me when I was here. The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. Remember. There was no sound now from the hunched figure. When I first met you the other day, said Vims, you made a point of showing me Arthur Carey's coat of arms. I thought it was a bit fishy at the time, but all that business with Nobby put it out of my mind. But I do remember it reminded me of the one for the Assassin's Guild. Vims flourished the parchment. I looked and looked at it last night, and then I wound my sense of humor down ten notches and let it go out of focus and looked at the crest, the fish-shaped lamp. Lampo Poisson, it's called. 
a sort of bilingual play on words, perhaps? A lamp of poison? You've got to have a mind like old detritus to spot that one. And Fred Cullen wondered why you'd left the motto in modern Ankian instead of putting it into the old language, and that made me wonder so I sat up with the dictionary and worked it out and, you know, it would have read Ars Anisa est candelum. Ars Anisa. That must have really cheered you up. You'd said who did it and how it was done and gave it to the poor bugger to be proud of. It didn't matter that no one else would spot it. It made you feel good. Because we ordinary mortals just aren't as clever as you, are we? He shook his head. Good grief, a coat of arms. Was that the bribe? Was that all it took? Dragon slumped in his chair. And then I wondered what was in it for you, continued Vims. Oh, there's a lot of people involved, I expect, for the same old reasons. But you? Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.